you want to start? Okay, so everybody, Ryan Berger is, um, well, was until yesterday. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> with, the Marine, <laughs> with the Marine Mammal Center, he's in um, mega transition mode right now. And um, he's been doing uh, response to whale entanglements for how long? Oh, I got started in uh, about 2008 when I was on the East Coast working for the state of Florida. So why don't you introduce yourself and uh, start your presentation, Ryan? Thank you so much. Sure, you bet. Uh, yeah, and I just I just want to say, you know, thank you to the stewards, all the volunteers, all the staff. I think uh, you guys do fantastic work. I'm a Sonoma County resident and live in Rio Nido, so uh, this county and the coastline is near and dear to my heart, along with the Redwoods. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today, for your interest, and, and um, for all the work that you guys do. Yeah, as Hollis had mentioned, I was with the Marine Mammal Center for about four years, and I'm currently in transition. I'll actually be moving out to Jenner soon to take on the preserve manager for the Wildlands Conservancy up the, at the Headlands. Uh, excited about that, but it is somewhat of a, a career shift for me. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Whale Entanglement Response and Prevention Program uh, overall, and then kind of what the Marine Mammal Center is doing uh, to help with these efforts. Uh, I've been involved with uh, Entangled Whale Response since 2008, uh, moved out to California in 2010, and continued to kind of get my foot in the door and increase my skill set. And last year, I was promoted to a level four disentangler, which I'll provide some context as to what that means. But what are we going to review today? Uh, we're kind of going to go over the structure of an entangled whale response. So it paints the picture of how these things happen. To pull it all together, we'll do a specific review of a case study. And then we'll talk about the Marine Mammal Center's involved with, involvement with science, the working group, mitigation. Uh, you know, the, the response aspect of it is, is important. It, it raises awareness. It's kind of compelling for the storytelling aspect, but it's a Band-Aid on the issue. The, if we're going to solve it long term, we really need to use data, science, and a bunch of people coming together uh, to share perspectives. If time allows, I have a, a few other additional short video clips to help paint the, the picture of what it looks like to be out on the water doing this. And then, of course, uh, thank you. And if there are any questions at the end, I'm happy to, to entertain those. I do want to start by just recognizing that uh, this is a threat. It's called bycatch and that it's not unique to the California coast, the Pacific Ocean, it is a global issue. So these entanglement and bycatch issues happen all around the globe. And if we're gonna solve this, we've gotta to come together in that way uh, to make sure that the right people are, are at the table to tackle the issues. It doesn't just impact marine mammals or whales, it also uh, impacts seabirds, sea turtles, other marine mammals, and anything that's living in the ocean. Right? If there's marine debris, fishing gear in the ocean, it can become entangled on these animals or on the environment itself. And it's not just limited to fishing gear. There are other marine debris that makes its way into the water that can be dangerous for all life that lives in it. Uh, and we do, I just wanna highlight that uh, for the fact that you know, the fishermen have really come to the table in, in this specific case around entangled whales and they're part of the solution and they wanna be part of that solution so that they have uh, a fishing, industry and a career that will sustain them into the future. So what is the structure of a response? The authorization level where it comes from is, is NOAA. They are our authorizing body. They oversee the work that we do and specifically within the Office of Protected Resources. Through the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Stranding Response Network was created by NOAA and specifically the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program, and right now we're working under the fifth version of that, is what allows us to do this work. And uh, it also allows us to do our, our stranding work to pinnipeds um, that Phil was referencing earlier as well. And the primary investigator, the person that holds the top of the permit is Dr. Terry Rolls, and she lives out in DC. So it's quite far away, but um, everything comes down to her. So through this process, we, we need to make sure that we're following proper techniques, using the right tools, and we're primar prioritizing human safety as we do this work. The authorization and what you're allowed to do is dependent on the level of experience and training. Uh, you're considered a co-investigator on Terry's permit when you get to the level three or level four status. And during a response, we use the ICS, the incident command structure, and the incident commander is pretty much equivalent to the co-investigator and the level four status under the permit. 
And these kind of get into a high level overview of what those levels are. So essentially at level one, you've attended a talk or you are aware of the issues that are around entangled whales. You understand what information is needed for reporting. You can do an initial assessment uh, and documentation, whether that's photo, video, writing stuff down and calling. So that's kind of a level one. And really after this presentation and gaining some awareness, you are considered part of the network and a level one responder. Level two, that takes it up just a notch. You're able to do a little bit more assessment, get closer to the whale within a respectful uh, distance, tracking the whale so that you can follow it as it moves through the water. If you are driving a boat, you're a competent boat handler and you know how to operate boats around whales and stay a safe, safe, safe distance away. Communications is key. Who do you contact? Who do you call? What kind of information are you looking for? Um, and then assisting the level three and level four uh, responders. At the level three status, you are, can essentially at uh, attach a satellite tag to the animal. And that is attached to the entangling gear. So not to the animal itself, but rather if there's gear trailing behind the animal that it's wrapped in, you attach the, the tag to it. That allows you to track the animal over time in case uh, you need to locate it if you can't uh, complete the task in one day. And then level four and level five, they, they lead all aspects of the response and they're in charge of disentangling the animal. The fifth, uh, the number five is species dependent. And if you live and work on the East Coast and, and deal with North Atlantic right whales, there's an extra level because um, they're particularly feisty and, and actually fight back during these processes. So if there's a, a mariner, a recreational a commercial fisherman out there on the water or uh, a mariner, a sailor, and they come across a whale and they think, that they suspect or it is confirmed that it's in distress or entangled, there's a hotline number for that. And so uh, if, you, if you know what that is through the awareness efforts, if you've uh, seen or you search online, it'll come up, uh, you know, what do I do to report an entangled whale? The number 877-SOS-WHALE will come up, call that and it gets routed to Justin Visbicki, who is the NOAA, the NOAA stranding coordinator down in Long Beach. And he's going to go through a series of questions to obtain uh, necessary information. One, he's going to document the name and contact number of the person reporting it so that they can get back in touch in case they need more information. And he's going to ask a series of questions that'll be, where are you? What's your location? What is the species, if you know it, of whale? What type of distress? Is it entangled? Is it just malnourished and looks skinny? Did it get hit by a ship? There might be uh, various reasons for calling it in. And then can you take any photographs? Photographs are really important and we'll discuss why. Probably one of the biggest and, and most helpful thing for whoever reports it and if you're out on the water still is to stand by that whale until uh, the network and experienced responders can show up. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. If you leave that whale, even though they're a great big animal, it's also a great big ocean. And so uh, if you don't stay with it, it can move quite a, a bit of distance and it's really hard to relocate. So we try to see if that person who reported can stand by and then hand off to another boat that's within the network. And then if all of these factors align, a trained team of responders will deploy. And, and what I mean by some of the factors are, what time of day is it? Is there enough daylight to respond? Um, are, are the expert personnel available or are they you know, somewhere else? Is the weather cooperating? Um, and then do you have the right assets? So if everything comes together, then uh, a trained number of individuals will respond to, to the animal and the report. Photo documentation. If you do happen to find yourself out on the water, some of the best things to do in terms of documentation is to get left and right sides of the animal. That helps with identification. But most importantly, if you haven't um, heard before, the underside of, a, a, especially a humpback whale's tail fluke, is like a fingerprint for a human. It's a unique identifier and there's a whole photo identification database that's set up. And if you submit that in, it'll actually look through the records and tell you if that animal has been seen before. So that's really important. Getting the uh, close-ups of the buoy. So what kind of gear is entangling the animal? What's the color of the rope? Uh, what are the colors of the buoys? And if there is no, if there are no buoys, then can you get other documentation that will help locate this animal? If there's not something surface gear dragging behind or attached to this animal, they can be really, really difficult to identify as being entangled at all, in fact. And then lastly, what is the entanglement? Where is the entanglement relative to the animal itself? Is it tight against the body? Is it dragging 100 feet behind? All of those reference points are really helpful in, in understanding how to formulate a plan and go about the disentanglement process. 
Uh, just mentioning, you know, again, there are uh, an official response network, and it oftentimes takes a village. It's not just one individual. It's a big, large vessel to get out to the animal. It's a small inflatable boat that's only 15 feet long that has a soft bottom so that you can closely approach and not injure the whale. The Coast Guard's usually involved. So there are a lot of teams that come together. And what we want to make aware is that to the public especially is that you don't need to take matters into your own hand. Uh, you know, there's been a few incidents a, couple, a few years ago down in Southern California where two fishermen were offshore. They came across an entangled whale, jumped on the back of the whale, cut the line. Don't know if it freed it entirely or not. So the, that's a big question mark because there was no documentation afterwards, but just a very dangerous situation. These animals don't know you're there to help. They have killed people in the past. We're not allowed to get in the water with them based on our protocols. And, you know, afterwards, uh, Ellen DeGeneres heard about that, invited those fishermen on and, and paid them both $10,000. So it was almost promoting that. And what we have to do is kind of counteract that a little bit and just say, hey, you know, slow down, make the right calls. There is a, a, an expert team that has the skill set to be able to go and do this safely and prioritize human safety. We also have a set of specialized tools and techniques. These techniques have been developed over decades of, you know, focus on this work. Uh, as I mentioned, you're not allowed to get in the water. It's very dangerous. Everything's done topside on, on, from an inflatable boat. And we work with uh, companies like Spiderco Knife Company, who fabricate and make specialized tools like recurved knives and hook knives, uh, stainless steel grapples to be able to attach to the, the line that's dragging behind an animal from a distance, carabiners. And then the, the big buoy that you see on the left here uh, has a really thick hole so that if it goes down as the whale dives into depth, it's not going to crush under the pressure that it experiences. And then it has a snorkel on the top where a satellite tag and telemetry tag can sit and you re can relocate that animal over time. Just emphasizing again, the dangerous aspect of this work, our primary objective is nobody gets hurt. Human safety is of the utmost importance. We are all concerned, that's why we do this work about the well-being of the animal. But if we don't take care of ourselves and our teammates, then we, aren't, we don't have the ability to go out the next day or the next event to respond and, and safely do this work. So we've got to prioritize that as number one. So that's kind of the, the initial steps and what happens when a report comes in or an entangled whale is found. Let's try to pull all these pieces together and, and walk through a, a bit of a case study review. Um, this one kind of highlights the, the points quite well. And it was back in 2014. It initially started in the Monterey Bay area. And then after about a three week period, uh, the, it finally concluded in Santa Barbara down south, which covered roughly 610 nautical miles. But you can see in April 27th, up at the top of the map, the, the first report came in uh, in Monterey. There was a two-day effort to do some documentation to see if there a disentanglement could happen. Unfortunately, weather didn't cooperate and so forth. Um, and, the, and the animal started swimming south. And as it swam south, it got into a very remote portion of the California coast. The weather also deteriorated. So there weren't a lot of opportunities or options to deploy a boat and respond as it was moving south and following some of the contour lines while it was feeding. But we were able to track it over time. So it was very helpful to have that tag, that satellite tag buoy on it. Finally, as it was starting to get to Southern California uh, near Point Conception and Santa Barbara and the Channel Islands, um, on the 14th of May, it came close enough inshore and the weather cooperated for us to be able to, to go down and finally finish off uh, what we had started about three weeks earlier. So on day one, what kind of the first initial step is once you get a report is, okay, let's sit back and, and watch the animal's behavior. Let's make sure it's safe to approach. But one of the next steps is let's attach the satellite buoy to the entangling gear. So what you can see here is that soft bottom boat, small, three people inside, we've got a, a person driving, we've got somebody in the middle that can hand gear, and then we've got a, a point person on the bow that's going to be picking up the gear and handling it. This is that, that satellite buoy. It's attached to the line itself, not to the whale, and it can either be via grapple or you can tie into this uh, directly. And these are the buoys of the crab pot gear that is following and trailing behind the whale itself. So we first attach that, um, and then the next step is to actually attach a, a, a video GoPro onto the end of a pole. You can get photos above the water and it, it'll paint a picture for you. But what really helps is what's going on underneath the water. And so this is GoPro video. And this is the tailstock coming down on either side. 
here's the leading edge of the, the tail flukes themselves. And then here's the line where you can see. So it cinched down and it wrapped around the tail stock and flukes right in this area. And as we zoomed in and we analyzed, we weren't able to complete all the process that day because it was the end of day and we ran out of daylight. But we did go back and we were able to analyze the, the, video, the video and the photos. And we noticed as we zoomed in that this is actually three wraps and it's starting to embed into that uh, tail itself. And then here's a, another shot. And this is the, oops, the trailing edge of the, the tail fluke. And here's the line that goes to the surface that has the buoys dragging behind. And then there was this other line that was going down to depth. And what we assumed is, okay, it must be dragging a crab pot. And that's why it's moving so slow. Um, that's why it's not using its, its tail all that well to swim. And that's the most powerful part of the animal. And that's how it propels itself through the water. So we analyzed and based on that, we came up with a game plan for game two. All right, let's day two, let's get out there. Let's locate the whale again with the, the satellite buoy. And then let's retrieve some of this gear. So what we were able to do is that line that was going down to depth, we were able to hook into it and lift it to the surface. 300 feet of hand over hand pulling as that whale was swimming and we were being drugged behind it, came up and the crab pot was still attached. So a lot of effort and work there. What we were able to do is cut the line, simplify the whole system and reduce um, uh, so that that wasn't dragging behind us anymore. What you can see is that satellite buoy is still attached and we actually added a, some additional flotation to it to try to keep it at the surface, tire it down and allow us to work the animal. Our hope was we could approach the whale closely and start to unwind those twists that were underneath the tail fluke and unwind the twists that were around the stock. So right here is the tail blades and the fluke. And this is how close we are. That's the danger zone. We wanna stay out of the danger zone as much as possible, but through the process of analysis and assessment, we learned that this animal wasn't using its tail flukes. And I think because everything was cinched around its tail stock, it didn't have the power or the comfort. It was in pain. So it was using its front flippers to move through the water, which allowed us some safety aspect to get a little bit closer. Unfortunately, as I'd mentioned before, the, the weather just started get the wind picked up, the swells were picking up, and we were about two hours away from port, and we were still in this inflatable boat. So we needed to turn around and go back for safety purposes. But we knew that we had that satellite buoy attached. Finally, after day 18, there was alignment. So this is the, the kind of bottom portion of that map that I showed earlier. Here are the Channel Islands. Here's the, the track lines of the whale moving through the water, feeding. And on day 18, it came right by the Santa Barbara Channel. We went down the night before, stayed the night on uh, one of the National Marine Sanctuary's vessels, and then came out early in the morning to relocate the whale where the weather uh, was cooperating and it was close enough to shore uh, for us to do that. This is relocating the whale. So inside that satellite tag is a VHF transmitter and you can hone in on more accuracy of where that whale is. And then of course you can use binoculars to help scope out where the location is exactly. We were able to do that and approach the whale again. So at this point, we wanna come, it, it still had this, uh, the satellite buoy on it, which is behind it, but now we're adding a lot more flotation. This is 18 days later, this whale's tired, it needs our help. So we're trying to slow it down, keep it at the surface. And you can see there's another orange buoy that we're gonna deploy over there. And um, what I do want to mention, I think the, the next uh, slide is going to show the difference from day one when we received the report and got video documentation to day 18 and how much damage was done to that whale's tail just by dragging that satellite buoy around. Uh, and there is some blood, there is some injuries. Uh, and just to be upfront, you know, this is what happens to these whales and, and it might be a little bit gruesome um, to watch and see. But here's day one, all that cinched down line. Here's day 18, where you can see a lot more damage done, scar tissue, uh, necrotic tissue, and whale lice. Whale lice is increasing on the, the animal itself. One thing that I wanna mention before we move on is as we started to unwrap this animal and around the tailstock, we recognized that there was a knot, a loop in there, and that that line was never gonna come undone by itself. So it necessarily needed to have you know, um, some intervention done and in a, in a cut to that rope to free it. The next slide is going to go over some video to, to kind of illustrate what this looks like in real time. It's a lot, so I'm going to kind of just paint the picture, turn the volume down a little bit. And what you can see is how calm the, the water is. It's a very calm day. 
Here's the entanglement on the, the whale itself. You can see the necrotic tissue. You can see how it's not using its tail fluke to swim through the water. Instead, there's a flash every once in a while up front of the animal, and that's using its front pec fins to swim through the water. What we were hoping to do is to get this line and drag it underneath the tail blade and start to come over and see if it would just unwind itself. But that's when we, we discovered there was a, a knot in it. So I'll go ahead and fast forward just a little bit to get to the point where we start to wrap the line across. We are following the whale and it's dragging us through the water. So we're not motoring. Our engine's actually kicked up because what we don't want is if that whale turned around to become part of the entanglement as well. So here comes the line over the, bl the blade of the fluke and it's gonna start pulling across through the wound. And we were hoping that that would just keep unraveling. starting to come across. Fast forward again, I accidentally set the uh, GoPro out of excitement down and, and then picked it back up. And we start to get a little bit more underwater documentation. So this is that, that pressure was on the wound when it was wrapped up. We started unwrapping it and it started relieving pressure. And so you can see a little bit of blood's coming out. Uh, you can see now how damaged and deep that line is. You can see where the knot is. But that whale was calm at the surface and it allowed for really good visibility of where to place that knife to make sure that the cut was in the right place. And I will fast forward again so that we can get to the point where the knife comes in. So here's the knife, it's a recurve, comes right into place, makes one little snap and, and cuts the whale free. Uh, I'll forward it again and it'll show, you know, again, Pressure's being relieved, so we're seeing some blood come, come out. And then eventually you see this line, as the whale's swimming through the water and we're holding on to the line, it's starting to shorten and floss through. And eventually that line falls away and the whale's disentangled. Uh, and I think this is the video part that shows that. Right there. So the right side came undone. And then the left side was still attached. We were in that boat. So the other one is still being dragged by the whale. Eventually with their drag as well, the, the left side of the, the rope that was embedded in came free also. So great success story. And here's, here's the funny thing in the end is we don't have any way to track these whales after they're disentangled. So we don't know how successful certain outcomes are, but this whale was seen right back up 48 days later from its first report in the Monterey Bay area, probably 500 meters from where it was reported. And it was now fluking, it was using its tail, it was hanging out with other humpback whales and feeding. And the, it's pretty remarkable how quickly these animals can recover and heal in the saltwater environment and with their uh, robust immune system. So we were able to confirm, get photo documentation, we've got undersides of the fluke. And so hopefully over time, we'll be able to track this whale and, and it's you know providing uh, offspring to, we don't know if it's a male or female, but it's out there breeding and, you know, contributing to the rest of the population. So good success story. But again, this is a little bit more of the band-aid. This response piece is saving individuals. What are we going to do about the issue itself? How are we going to solve that? And that's where we get into what the Marine Mammal Center and other partners and other organizations are doing on the science and mitigation aspect. So what's being done? There's extensive re outreach, trying to understand this, educate the public, there's initiatives like the best practice guide uh, out to fishermen. So instead of having a bunch of line at the surface where it's really like spaghetti and a whale can you know, swim through it and become entangled, let's make sure that we're fishing within certain best practices and keep that line that goes down as taut as possible and not as much uh, uh, slop at the, 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 the top of the surface. Analysis and review of data and using new specialized equipment to help with that provide scientific expertise and develop tools. So there's a big gear innovation uh, summit that's going on. How can we, instead of having a pot that sits on the bottom of the ocean with one line and buoys at the top, how can we sink all of that down to the bottom using acoustic pinger? And then that releases the buoys and then the fisherman collects that gear all at once. And so that we don't have those lines just sitting in the water column. And then funding, funding through the government um, to help with these different projects that are going on. There was a working group uh, that was convened in 2015. If you remember our ocean uh, in the 2014 to 16 time period, 
uh, it was when the marine heat wave was here and the marine, the, the warm water blob, and that created a lot of disruption in the system. And the, the number of entanglement reports spiked. And because of that, the, uh, the, the state took initiative to create a working group that had 25 people involved. It's comprised of different stakeholders like commercial and recreational fishermen, federal and state agencies, nonprofit organizations, the scientific community, and advocacy groups. They all come together on a regular basis to talk about what these issues are, try to share perspectives, and come up with solutions down the road. And so what is that to, you know, specifically changing in fishing activity to reduce the risk, establish priorities for addressing entanglements, share this information out, and develop recommendations regarding funding, management changes, and other actions. One of those things that recently um, has increased is the Marine Mammal Center has partnered with other groups like Cascadia Research Collective and have acquired new research vessels to go far offshore and do these vessel surveys at timely, you know, that coincide with the start, middle, and end of the fishing season so that there's some information that directly feeds into the system. Short term, these vessel surveys are looking at whale occurrence and distribution and how that overlaps with fisheries. Long term, it's looking at whale abundance and the population trends, stock structure, and that happens through photo identification. And then while the boats are out there, if they have an expert team that's ready to, to, to respond to an entanglement, there are proactive efforts to disentangle whales and improve reporting to NOAA on the documentation of these entanglements, how, when, why, and where. The way these are set up, here's Oregon, here's Northern California, here is Central California, so our coastline, Russian River up here, down to Monterey, and then south of Monterey, all the way to Morro Bay. And these coincide with the Dungeness crab fishing areas. And essentially the surveys are lined up to go on the 70 meter lines to look at inshore, and then more offshore near the continental shelf, the 200 meter lines. And what are you picking up with respect to the distribution, species, and abundance of whales when you're out there? And how can you inform everybody that's involved with this as to what management decisions need to be made in a timely manner? So this is one example. This is that central California coast area from the Russian River down to Monterey. And you can see our transect lines, our boat vessel lines are being tracked here. And these numbers indicate in the colors how many whales were seen and what species. So big pocket off the, the tip of Point Reyes and near the Farallons, a huge amount of whales there. And this was done, I think, in uh, October before October 2020, before the fishing season, crab fishing season would open in November. And then a big pocket of whales down here in the Monterey Bay area. Th that data was provided almost the next day and it was put into the working group and they analyzed it and reviewed it. And it went into making a management decision about the, the start of that crab fishing season. And so here's kind of a, a, a graphic that shows how these surveys and regulations with the working group kind of work together. There's what is the available data? Let's meet monthly or more frequently to, to look at the risks. What are the triggers? You know, is, it, is there demoic acid that's going to delay the season? Are whale abundance uh, numbers still high in the area? Um, what is the weather doing? What are the ocean conditions like? Um, is it going to be a big krill year or is it more anchovy? Because that impacts where whales are going to be distributed. And then these are where the working group meets and they start to at, at access the scope of the risk, make management considerations, recommend to the director, who then the director Bonham of, of California Fish and Wildlife Service will make their declaration, communicate to the fleet and implement management changes. And so from that data that was collected, there was this uh, authorization from director Bonham about delaying the start of the, the fishing season. So instead of opening in the middle of November, coinciding with Thanksgiving, because whale concentrations were high, the fishing fleet and the fishermen and the state all agreed, let's push the opening of the season back to December 2020. That happened this past season as well. So direct applied um, aspects to trying to solve this issue. And because those things have been in place, the number of entangled whales in the reports have gone down considerably. So continuing to do this and combine it with gear innovations is going to be crucial for solving this problem long term. Uh, I've got a few other videos to, to just kind of showcase. This one was a young juvenile humpback whale off the coast of uh, California here near the Farallons. And we're, we're, being, we're 
drag behind it again. It's called the Nantucket sleigh ride. And you'll see this whale come up on the end of the pole as a GoPro. We're just trying to document more information. This whale doesn't know we're there to help. And it actually kind of lashes out and does a tail slash to see if it could uh, to come in contact with us. So really important to make sure you know whale behavior, when these animals might respond that way, and how to stay a safe distance away, yet keep doing the work that you're trying to do when you're out there working with them, and they don't know that you're there to help. Here's the same whale. It's, um, it's just, this is showing what we're trying to do. This animal had line through its mouth, went around its head, and then was wrapped around its right pec fin. And we were trying to make cuts to the, the line. It was too embedded in the skin, so we weren't able to get the knife close to it. But what we were able to do is to work on that right-hand side, and then we were adding additional kegging to it to see if the drag would pull the line out. Oops, sorry about that. Let's see, there we go. So the other, other responders are on a larger vessel, um, the National Marine Sanctuaries vessel, and they're taking this footage from more of an aerial perspective. Again, we have the engine tilted up, and we're trying to see if the, that line will floss through based on uh, the cuts that we had made earlier. You can see how the line is wrapped around the head and went behind the blowhole. This is the same whale in, in response effort, but underwater. And this is the knife that we're trying to get close to. Here is where the line, that white line, is coming out of the, the kind of the jaw of the animal, wrapping across the head. Here's the blowhole. Here's the eye. And then you'll see it rotate through, and it'll expose the right pec fin. And that's what we were looking for um, to make the cuts. Here's where it's wrapped around the right fin. Uh, this is another uh, response. This happened in the Big Sur area in 2016, another humpback whale. In the beginning of this uh, video, what you're gonna see is on a free swimming whale, it can move through the water column. And sometimes the best approach is actually for the boat driver to match the same speed as the whale and get parallel to it, wait for that whale to start coming up to the surface, and then reaching out with the knife and trying to make the cut. This animal had two wraps around its body that were kind of forward near its head. It was an embedded line. It was a fairly fresh entanglement. So it wasn't you know digging into the skin, but it was tight, tightly wrapped around. It was dragging gear behind it. And so we, we drive next to it side by side, make one cut, but we didn't cut both lines. So after that first maneuver, the whale started becoming very evasive and it wasn't allowing us to track it parallel. We ended up having to go back behind it, be dragged behind where the flukes were and then reach out with more extensions of the carbon fiber pole to try to make the cut. And in the end, um, there's a lot of excitement. We were successful. Sometimes, you know, you're so focused in the moment and you wanna, you wanna do that for uh, safety purposes, but there is a, a kind of a, a release of excitement and energy afterwards. And you'll see the team celebrate a little bit. It's kind of fun to see what it's like uh, firsthand. So I'll let this video play. You'll hear our communications as well. I'm trying to, I'm in the front and I'm trying to communicate to the boat driver about the speed, the direction that it's headed, trying to make, match the pace of the whale. So I could feel the tension when I pulled the knife back that it had hooked onto one of the pieces of rope. Uh, so I was pretty sure that we had, we'd actually, but we realized that it wasn't fully disentangled. So then the next set you'll see, here's the tails, uh, the whale's tail, we're kind of right behind it. We have five sections of carbon fiber pole because we need to reach way in front of the whale. It was a, it was a large adult whale and we needed all that distance to be able to get um, closer to the head where the wrap was still attached. And you'll see how violent this animal reacts. Once it feels the pressure released, it flips its tail and then we fall backwards, kind of drift away after the, uh, the cut is made.
Scott was pretty excited. This is just kind of to provide perspective of that last cut, you know, it was since it was the first person view. Um, this, these were the length of carbon fiber pole, about 35 feet. The, the whale was entangled uh, up front near the head, and it, it required quite a bit of distance to reach out and, um, and make the cut. So we pretty much got lucky on this one, uh, considering how far we had to be. But you can see that splash at the end as well. So those were just some additional videos to try to help illustrate, you know, what it's like when you're out there on the water. Um, and then, you know, kind of the dangerous aspects of it, but also the excitement of the, the crew and the teams that, that get to, to respond. You know, what can we do just to reiterate, you know, what can we do to reduce entanglements? Again, where, where's the co-occurrence? By going out and doing surveys and seeing the overlap of whales and fishing gear, how do we reduce that so that there's not so much, and not just fishing gear, but marine debris. Improve gear to make it less likely to entangle whales. You know, again, talking about the gear innovation and, and looking at um, sinking all that gear to the bottom so that there aren't lines constantly in the water. Uh, improve gear to make it entanglements less severe or allow them to escape. There are weak links that they're thinking about putting into sections of the rope or near the pots so that that you know big, heavy, strong whale comes across it, it can actually break free and not drag that pot and not become so entangled. Deterrence and avoidance, you know, where are whales and where are humans? And then getting smarter, you know, through our research, through a scientific um, approach, fill the information gaps and then use that to inform these management decisions over time. We oftentimes get asked the question of what can you do to help? And for some reason, my computer froze. <laughs> can everybody still hear me? I, I, it doesn't look like my video froze or anything, but it's just confirming. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, you're, okay. Your, your audio is fine. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know why it's not advancing to the next slide, but with that said, there was only one more. Um, it talks about you know, how you can help. And really the, the best way there is uh, prompt and accurate reporting, um, photo documentation. If you do find yourself out on the, on the water and come across standby, if you're on a vessel and standing by to hand off that, that uh, whale to another boat, um, creating a safety perimeter, talking to other boats in the area and letting them know that, that there is a whale out there entangled, uh, communication, educating yourself, and then informing others about this issue. And of course, if you do eat seafood, you know, choosing sustainable seafood uh, choices, that, that does help because there are various ways that these uh, crabs are caught. Well, not crabs themselves, they're actually done pretty sustainably, but uh, other fisheries that are out there. So apologies for uh, my video freezing or the, power, the presentation freezing, but I, if there are any questions, that is the end of the presentation. Um, really appreciate the time and again, the opportunity to do this and happy to entertain uh, any questions if there are. Yeah, Ron, get involved. Oh, go ahead, Kate. I have two questions. First of all, uh, I assume you're you're tracking um, things like the number of crab pots and the time that they are in versus the number of entanglements. Is that information available somewhere to the public? Can we take a look at those that data in any way or yeah, the great thing about the working group is um, and I, I don't have it, but if you search the California Dungeness Crab Working Group, okay. it, a website will come up and all of the data, all of the information, all the meeting notes that they've had over the years are available to the public. And to your point, um, the state tracks the number of crab pots, the number of landings. And so all that information is shared on those web pages and, and you can find like detailed information there. It's a great question. The second question is, um, if you know a whale can't possibly be disentangled, do you still tag it? And I'm thinking specifically of that gray whale a couple of years ago that came up the coast with the metal frame around mm. its head. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, it's difficult. And, we, you know, the reality of, of, again, each of these unique situations is that we have to assess it through, so through photo, photos, through video, through past experience. That was going to take a special case. You're, you know, we were talking, we were meeting all together about this. Uh, like, what do we do? We've never dealt with a metal frame around uh, mm -hmm. an animal's head. So we were even talking about how do we get some loppers that we might be able to reach out on an extension pole, you know, to cut that because our knives and other techniques aren't going to yeah. work against it. Well, um, so we do stand down sometimes, unfortunately. The question, the question wasn't, you know, what do you do if you you can't disentangle because it was obvious you weren't going to get that thing off that well. Oh, yeah. The question was, do you still track it? 
Oh, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. So we wouldn't. And, and the reason is we're looking for technology to advance. We do have these suction cup tags that are out there, but they fall off of whales after a few weeks. So right. it's not long term. And our satellite buoys, they're so they're like 10,000 or more dollars. So if we put that on there just to track it and not be able to go out and do something, we're, it's just because of the cost effectiveness of it. We can't like um, put a bunch of those tags on the way. Well, that's understandable. I was just yeah. curious because I know, um, you know, there was a point we lost track of it. And I was wondering mm-hmm. if there's a way, you know, for us to, to find out, first of all, where that debris came from and, and um, you know, how long the whale can, you know, can last with that kind of mm-hmm. debris on it, things like that. So, yeah. It's it's an important piece, and I hope that someday the technology advances and that thing has become um, cost effective, and that each time, like one of the other primary things during the response is you're going to put that tag on now, and now you can follow it for longer term. Thank you. Thank you. How many rescues are done per year, Ryan? Yeah, the, I did have a, a data slide um, that I didn't include in this, but. Um, I would say probably about 10 to 20% of the reports. And again, a lot of that is, so, you know, in 2016, there were 70 reports of entangled whales, which is just crazy. That year was just insane. We were able to go out on about 20 of those. And most of those were successful disentanglements. But the issue again is we might get a report, but because all the, the stars don't align, you know, with time of day, the weather, who's available, the distance to get to the animals, uh, you don't always get there on those reports. So it's a fraction of it. And again, I think is also why this is more of a Band-Aid. The response side is a Band-Aid on the issue. The solutions are going to be the science, the gear innovations, all those sort of things. And are the entanglements increasing or, you know, either due to better reporting or um, more opportunities for them to get entangled? Yes. So for a while, the average was about 10 a year from like 2002 to 2012. Then numbers just started increasing. And I think it was a combination of whale populations rebounding, more fishing efforts, but also more education and outreach. More people knew that this was going on and they were attending these lectures. We were getting the word out there more. Since these um, mitigation efforts have happened, since the working group has been developed, we've now seen the trends going down. So what was 70 reports, this past year, we only had 10 at the most. And so th- things are working. Again, we've learned from lessons in the past. If we run into another warm water blob year, we're not going to allow the fishermen to delay their season, put all their pot- pots out in March to try to salvage it. That coincides exactly when the whales come back, and that created that situation. So things like that, learning from lessons in the past, I think we're going to be a lot better off in the future um, with this situation, especially as the gear innovations come into hand. Uh, ho- hopefully we get to zero, you know, likely not because there's other things out in the water that um, whales can become entangled in, but it is working and the number of reports are going down. So it's my understanding that crab and lobster pots, the, these buoys are marked uh, to show the ownership of the, so do you have people who are kind of, I don't want to say repeat offenders because I mean, they're not out there <laughs> trapping whales, but do you have certain companies that tend to entangle more and is it due to location or the type of equipment that they use? Yes, another great question. Um, and, and actually Dungeness Crab was kind of unfairly being blamed for this for a while because they're the only ones that tag their gears. So there was no way to identify other types of trap gear that it was out there and it was all coming back to the Dungeness Crab. Now the state has required all trap fishermen to mark their gear, either with a tag or a different color line or buoys. So it's getting better. But yes, there are repeat offenders. And that is a great point because if we have that repeat offense and we're able to document the the tag number and who it belongs to, one, you can call the fisherman up and you can get information from it. When did you set your gear? How deep was it? What was the scope on the rope? You know, all this stuff that feeds into the data that helps explain why these animals are getting entangled. And if if people are doing the wrong thing, not following the best practice guide, they're going to get dinged. They're going to get fined by NOAA. And the great thing about the fishing fleet and how not all fishermen are created equal in that regard. They self-police as well because they know that if it, right now there's a lawsuit by the Center for Biological Diversity. If they don't follow these guidelines and they keep doing this, their whole entire industry gets shut down. Now nobody's fishing. They have skin in the game. They want to make sure that this continues on. So there, there's a lot of buy-in. It's just you're going to get some bad apples and bad players every once in a while. Kind of a personal question, Ryan. How did you get involved in this? 
Oh gosh. I mean, just luck. I don't know. Uh, I am, I'm a Midwest boy. I'm from Illinois originally. Never thought I'd be working in the ocean, but I think cause it was so foreign to me, uh, it was an attraction. I, you know, I, when I was working, I was studying manatees for uh, my master's degree and I was working in Florida and there's a seasonality to manatees in Jacksonville, the Northern portion. So they move South to find warmer water. And then that coincides with the North Atlantic right whale coming down to calve and breed off of the coast. And so just because the manatees weren't there, my time got freed up and I was able to get involved with the program of entangled whale response and, and doing research on uh, right whales. And it just was, it was kind of a passion. You know, I recognized that I had a little bit of a skill set um, to do this sort of work and uh, just kind of networked and, and put the time in. And, and luckily I've had the jobs and profession that prioritize this and that give me the flexibility to be able to respond because you never know. It's like emergency response. You don't know when they're going to get uh, called up. And so you kind of have to be ready at the drop of the hat to, to respond and have the right profession, the right time and availability to do it. So do you respond all the way up and down the coast or are there centers of people? Yeah, there are centers of people, although there's a big black hole. As soon as you get north of, uh, and Monterey is probably the hub. There's the most attention. That's because there's a ton of whale watching boats and you know people on the water a lot there. So there's a lot of experienced folks in that area. As soon as you get north of San Francisco and you get all the way up to, there's just, you know, there's so many few, so fewer people and not as many ports to, to get in and out of. So I've, I've responded from Crescent City all the way down to Santa Barbara. That's the range that I've been involved with. But as you get further south, there are other groups that, are, that participate in this network as well. So how long does it take you to get to a site? Like if there's a report up near Crescent City. Oh, I mean, the, the one I think I highlighted a couple of years when I gave a, a go, when I gave a talk was a grounded animal up in Crescent City. We drove that night, took us six hours to get up there, stayed in a hotel. Um, luckily, the animal wasn't free swimming. So we, we had it could get to the surface and breathe, but it couldn't move that far. And that way we knew its location. We were able to formulate a plan. And it took us the whole next day to, um, to be successful in the disentanglement. And then we stayed another night in the hotel and drove back down. So it's, it's a really short and intense uh, event. And it's, it's you know, kind of stressful. Your adrenaline's pumping. I'm usually exhausted afterwards. But um, you know, luckily, Noah's there. I've worked for organizations that support it. Um, so we try to keep that safety in mind. If the whale wasn't grounded, it wasn't in place, that's one of those situations where we have to weigh, okay, well, how far are we from it? And do we actually respond? If we're not going to be able to locate it again, how much effort are we going to put in to, you know, doing all of that, especially if, if safety is one of our number one priorities. Yeah. It's like a needle in a haystack. <laughs> you start moving. Exactly. Uh, so I assume there's also response groups in Oregon and Washington along the coast. And is that correct? That is correct. Washington, yes. Oregon takes a different approach. Their, their whole philosophy is actually, um, well, they, don't, they have a more rugged coast. It's harder to, to get out. Right. Um, but their marine mammal response program is actually more about if it's directly human related, then they'll respond. But a lot, they don't have like a, a network where if seals or sea lions hit the beach and there's no human cause, they don't really respond to it. So not as, not as much out of um, Oregon, although the universities do have some teams that do it. Washington has uh, Cascadia Research Collective and SR3. Those are the two big groups that are up there that do entangled whale response. So if you lose a whale going north that's entangled, you just contact these other states and... Yeah, we're all connected and on a monthly basis, we have a, a call uh, for the West Coast and we all, all the groups up and down um, the three states and in, in Alaska as well, plus Hawaii, um, although they're kind of a separate unit because humpbacks, that population shares uh, the migration. And so we'll get together and we'll talk about what cases are up, you know, what trainings are going to come so that we can stay informed about any, any animals that might be traveling north or south uh, that are entangled. So does anybody have any other questions for Ryan? You know, please feel free to unmute yourself. And I am, I'm trying to even hit escape out of this and I cannot get out of my computer footer. I'm glad that it worked through the end of the presentation. <laughs> by high tech, die by high tech. You're right. <laughs> well, Ryan, I really appreciate your presenting to us today. I know that you're in the middle of a hundred different things going on when you're trying to move and uh, start a new job. So thank you very, very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And um, I look forward to seeing hopefully many of you out on the Sonoma Coast. 
Uh, and thank you for, again for all the work that you do. It's it's very important. And uh, yeah, I hope to maybe be doing some of that work out there with you someday. 